Hello everyone, nice to see you all. Hi. Welcome to this talk together on um, yeah, universal education, on secular ethics, on basically the good heart and human values. So before we start, or as we start, we can just settle our minds and our bodies into, into the room, into the, yeah, just settle ourselves into this moment now. Um, a big element of this um, universal education, um, promoting these human values, is the mindfulness aspect as well, the just being present and aware, because the more spaciousness we have in our mind to see what's going on in there, the more we can work with it and nurture what's good in our hearts. So um, just some basic present stillness can be a really helpful tool for that. So I invite you all to just sit comfortably and just gently let your eyes close or keep them slightly open if you like to. Um, and yeah, just sit comfortably for a few moments and take two or three nice deep breaths. Um, so breathing in and then as you breathe out, releasing, just scanning through your body and releasing any tension that you find in your body, in your neck and shoulders or your jaw, your stomach, your calf muscles. So as you breathe out with each breath, with, a, with each out breath, release any tension that you're holding in your body. As your body and mind settle into this moment, into this place, just focus your awareness on your breathing for a few moments. As like His Holiness Dalai Lama says, like our breathing is, is like the bridge that unites our body and mind. So without changing your breathing pattern, just breathing normally, but paying attention to the sensations in your body as you breathe in and out. And just enjoy this stillness for a few moments. And then spending a few moments just generating and feeling a sense of appreciation for the body that you have. These legs that carry you around from place to place, that brought you up the hill to Dushita. With the eyes that you can see all the beautiful things. And the ears that can hear bird song arms that you can hug your relatives with and your friends and even subtle your even your breath and your heartbeat that keep you alive just feel a sense of appreciation for the body and the life that you have just as it is
and with that sense of appreciation and recognition of the preciousness of this life that we have, just determining to use the remainder of our life to live the rest of our life in, in a way in whatever is meaningful for you. We all want to be happy. None of us wants any problems. We want to be happy and that's our right. So just thinking we will live our lives in a way that will in promote and increase the happiness and well-being of ourselves and the people around us and that will ripple out into the society and be a contribution for the happiness and well-being and the peace of the whole of humanity. So we can set our motivation for this time together in this short session to thinking that yeah, going inward and looking at, discussing these human values. Uh, may our time together be our, our contribution to a peaceful, happy world. So allowing your mind to mix with this med uh, motivation for a few moments. And again, just resting your attention on your breathing for a few more moments. Observing any changes in your, your body or mind. And then in your own time, bring your awareness back to the room and slowly open your eyes. So Kumpinla gave me a very generous introduction. I was a bit embarrassed about that, but <laughs> um, it's really my pleasure to be here and discuss these human values with you. It's something that I really find important and have a passion about, and I really took to heart. Um, yeah, Lama Yeshi's kind of vision and wish for these human values to be, yeah, increase our awareness of them and learn tools to develop our good values. And also it's one of His Holiness Dalai Lama's main four commitments to help to promote secular ethics in the secular way, meaning whether you subscribe to a religion or a spiritual tradition or whether you, uh, you don't hold any tradition, just the fact that, that we're human and we value, <laughs> you know, good qualities and positive behaviors and positive ways of thinking and, and just, yeah, good ethical behavior. So because that's just the nature of us humans to do that, then um, it's worthwhile to cultivate those. 
and His Holiness seeing a lack in the current education system for discussing and promoting and um, educating people about these human values, then it's also His Holiness's wish to bring this education to light. So, yeah, it's a, I feel happy that in our small way, in our coming together to discuss these, it's a little way contributing to that. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, And so those of you in the room, you've all been taking part of this course of an introduction to Buddhism and, and Venerable Wang Dula's let me know where you're up to in the course, which sounds fantastic because you, he touched, you know, you've probably covered a lot over the course already, but specifically today with dependent arising. So, um, we, so basically this, um, yeah, so basically you're already ripe for the, what we're going to be discussing about today. And you've been learning it from in the presentation of the Buddhist framework and the, the bigger long-term goal of things, but you'll see how we can bring it down to even just day-to-day -day life and, yeah, how these, these ideas and cultivating them can contribute just to our, our well-being and the well-being of those around us in the society. Yeah. So that's your job to skillfully try and weave in how that fits in with, yeah, how these two fit in together. And so, like Kumbhinla said, so um, this, um, what we're going to talk about today is in the framework of the 16 guidelines. So years and years ago, in a place far, far away, <laughs> so back into Tibet, one of the ancient kings there, one of the really um, the prominent, powerful kings there, King Sonsen Gambo, he laid out these 16 guidelines, or 16 human dharmas, he called them back then, to just help the people in his society live harmoniously and happily together. And Lama Zobar Rinpoche, he thought that these are still very relevant today um, in this modern world, but he modified them slightly. So a couple of them maybe have been taken out, a couple have been replaced. For, for example, forgiveness is in there, in these 16 guidelines. It wasn't in the original. Um, and some of them, the way that they're expressed might have just been slightly modified. So we're not going to go through all the 16 in this short time. Basically, those 16 guidelines are condensed into what are called four wisdom themes. So basically... Of, if, we, if we were to list all the different qualities of humanity and all the different human values that we have, there's way more than 16, you know. But here we're just looking at a few main ones that we can get working with to inspire us, to, you know, and then we can branch out from that and, and grow from that. Um, but some of the main ones we'll find here. Um, so these four wisdom themes... Um, yeah, basically, it's how we think, how we act, how we relate, and how we find meaning. So how we think, how we act, how we relate, and how we find meaning. Um, so in the framework of the um, 16 guidelines, the way they've been... Um, set up by the by our organization there's a lot of um, like media um, what do you call it <laughs> like we watch little clips from YouTube and things like that how do you say <laughs> to give you inspiration and things as well and they draw on quotes from different people from around the world that are inspiring people around the world and um there's one here that I love, but I always pronounce his name <laughs> wrong, sorry. So he's from, German, he's, he's from Germany. You've probably all heard of him. Jo Johann Wolfgang, is it Goethe? Do you say Goethe? I was saying that wrong before. So Johann Wol Wolfgang Goethe. So I love this quote from him. It's a little bit long. It's um, is it five lines, but this really like condenses these four wisdom themes as well. So what he says is, watch your thoughts for they become your words. Watch your words, for they become your actions. Watch your actions, for they become your habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. So it's really nice and succinct, right? Quite powerful, really. So it all comes back from our thoughts. In fact, the whole world that we're in, this building that we're in, you know, this town that we're in, this country that we're in, you know, most of us have travelled through Delhi to get here. What a massive city with some incredible architecture and infrastructure there and things. 
and the planes that most of us would have got on to get here, or trains or automobiles and things, none of them came about without someone having the idea to bring them about, right? So the natural world, this beautiful forest that we're living in, um, yeah, that was already here. But a lot of the... Repeat the quote? Yeah, of course, yeah. Watch your thoughts, for they become your words. Watch your words, for they become your actions. Watch your actions, for they become your habits. Watch your habits, for they become your character. And then watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. So the power of our thoughts. Yeah. So that's why the first go- guideline yeah, is how we think. And then from that, how we act. Then from that, how we relate to others. And from that, how we find meaning. And so these 16 guidelines all have, um, they all have definitions that have been um, sort of cultivated from this, um, from the universal education, um, which is, um, it's called Foundation for the Development of Compassion and Wisdom, the FDCW. That's the organization that you can find online afterwards if you want to follow up on this, or you can find out in the office. So they've given like, succinct little definitions for each of these 16 guidelines, but they're not like um, absolute, basically. They're working guidelines to give an idea, a sense of, well, for example, the first value is humility. So it will be defined as something, but you don't have to hold fast to that because we all have our own ideas of what humility means to us, what being humble means to us. So in this framework, we give the definitions as something to work with and chew over and discuss to get a feel for together, for us to look inward and see what we think about that guideline, that concept of like humility, for example. And so, um, yeah, they give us a working basis for our discussions and our reflections. So basically, don't take anything you're hearing here and think it has to be like that. You might have you know, coming from a different perspective, you might see it in a different way, or you might have a complete, you might say, no, it's definitely not like that, and I welcome any challenge, you know, we can have some discussion about it. But like I say, we're not going to go through all 16, and of the four wisdom themes, I felt like I wanted to talk with you about the how we relate, how we relate with others together today. So that's what I want to base our discussion on. I usually start with the first guideline and one of the um, the first wisdom theme of how we think and one of the guidelines in there but I don't know lately this whole thing of how we relate to others I've been reflecting myself personally about how much I think that's one of the personally I think that's one of the most important things in life so that's why I'm going to talk about with you today so among this wisdom theme of how we relate to others. There are um, yeah, four guidelines that come under it. Like I say, not exhaustive, but the ones that they've come up with to d- discuss and reflect on in this wisdom theme are respect, forgiveness, gratitude, and loyalty. Respect, forgiveness, gratitude, and loyalty. So in our little motivation, um, in our mindfulness reflection at the start, we already touched on gratitude, thinking about gratitude for our own body. So yeah, let's think about when the way we... So this wisdom theme is looking at how we relate to others. Um, I would like to start by thinking taking it like how we relate to ourselves first. Um, And so even before that, to step right back to the beginning again, 
even though we're not firing yet. <laughs> so when we look at human values or ethical behaviour, if we think about it, we already value it in society. When we look at, like in our, each of our own countries and in general in, in the world, there's like a, a way that it's okay to be in this world. Like we have laws about like killing each other. It's not good, not okay. You know, in most countries, probably all, there's laws to protect us other people from, yeah, harm, yeah, to protect each other from harm, to have a harmonious, like, easygoing, peaceful society. There are certain laws in place to stop us acting out certain behaviours, right? So, in general, in society, we have, we value ethical behaviour, right? And then on a personal level, we all prefer it when people are kinder to us, and do more helpful things to us. And we don't like it so much when people come and punch us in the face or get angry at us and, you know, and uh, can't tolerate us and lie to us and things. We prefer it when others don't do that. And we prefer it when people are kinder to us and, yeah, more patient with us when we're having a bad day and more understanding of us when we make mistakes, right? We can all relate to that. But then... If you take it to an even deeper level, think about ourselves. How do you feel? How do, how do we feel when we are the ones who are being patient, being kind to others, being tolerant, um, being understanding of other people's mistakes, being loving and caring to others? How do we feel when, we're being, when, we, when we have those values in our heart, when we are coming from that place of being patient or kind or understanding. You know, we're more aware of how we respond when other people are being that way to us. But can you see for ourselves, we actually feel better in ourselves when we're coming from those place, that place of more human values and more ethical behavior compared to, we usually feel embarrassed or ashamed or a bit, you know, like beat ourselves up if we've gotten angry and said something to someone out of anger or something, don't we? We don't usually feel, we go, oh, that's not me. That's not how I normally am. I didn't mean to say it like that. That's how we usually feel, right? So inside us as well, we actually, we do value these, um, these, yeah, ethical, more ethical ways of being, right? And a good heart. So looking at that, then it's not just like something that society imposes on us or someone else imposes on us that we should be like that. When we reflect a little deeper on it, we recognize that it's more in our nature to be more on the side of being more kind-hearted. And we feel better and more at ease in ourselves. And there is actually, and most of you probably already aware, there is like scientific evidence that backs up you know, from the neuroscience perspective and the other scientific fields of study, that, like, for example, anger and things harm our immune system, and things like compassion actually promote and enhance our immune system. There are studies with backed up proof to evidence to show that. That's another sign as well that that our nature is goodness. <laughs> And when you look on top of that, just we have these natural tendencies of, of certain behaviors, but then when we can like engage in a more contemplative practice of like nurturing these qualities of awareness and patience and loving kindness and things. So there are, there are benefits of, of um, contemplative practice that are backed by research. So the, there's some brief things here of some Re, uh, conclusions of two and a half thousand different research projects. So that's not just one or two, it's two and a half thousand ones. That some benefits of contemplative practice on the, both the mind and the body. So on the mind, less neurosis, a higher, ha, a higher level of happiness, a sense of more care for others, a lower risk of stress, and enhanced clarity. 
So those are just a few of the benefits of a more contemplative practice. And then for the body, on, on the mind, then for the body, there's a lower risk of problems with heart attacks and strokes, blood pressure, cancer, flu, memory loss. So a lower risk of those problems and then enhanced immune system response. So that's quite substantial issues that, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, it's in, increased, yeah, it's like in our, in our favor to be a bit more reflective inward and uh, develop these qualities more, right? <clears throat> okay, so if we go a little bit more into these four guidelines then of, again, so under the, under this thing of looking at how we relate to others. Oh, yeah, no, before, yeah, okay, we'll bring these in and then go back to ourselves first. Okay, so the top, we're looking at how we relate to others, but like I say, I want to bring it home a bit more first, look at how we relate to ourselves. So, but we'll, we'll do it in the framework of these four guidelines. So, again, we have gratitude, respect, loyalty, and forgiveness. I might have said them in a different order before, it's okay. So, if we look at, this guideline of gratitude, then how it's defined in the universal education is to acknowledge and repay the kindness of others. To acknowledge and repay the kindness of others. <laughs> to acknowledge and repay the kindness of others. But like in our little reflection earlier, just looking at our own bodies, I, I think my, my grandmother, my, before she passed away, she made it to a 82, when she was coming on for around 80, and she was getting a bit slower on her feet. She was still very nimble, but she would say things, and my dad would say to her, like, your little feet have carried you around for 80 years, you know? And then she'd feel really, yeah, happy. The, for her feet and her tired legs and things. And so, yeah, normally we're pushing ourselves so, so hard to just get up a bit out of bed and go on and do what we need to do in the day and stuff. So how much do we take a, take a little time to look after ourselves? How much do we take a little time to appreciate our body? And, you know, we push it and work. we make it work for us for whatever in our heads we think we need to go and do that day. So, you know, to just have a little gratitude and, yeah maybe soak our feet in some Epsom salts from time to time. No, <laughs> no just this meant not necessarily doing, it's a more attitude of, an attitude rather than what we do, just having this sense of appreciation, yeah, for the body we have, the life, the life that we have. Oh, quite a few years ago, I can't remember clearly, one of the sad natural disasters that happened in the world, I think it was a massive tsunami, and I think it hit in Indonesia. Sorry if it's not. So do you, is it? Was that? Yeah. Thank you. God, I remember watching on the news, right? So the whole islands were completely obliterated. Most people's homes were completely destroyed. And, but all, so the news reporter was here giving the interview, and behind him were there were all these people. They had all come from where their homes were and gathered at the nearby town hall, because I think there was a bit of electricity so they could plug their phones in, the ones who'd managed to bring their phones. And he was saying that in talking with these people, they've all lost their homes, their whole lives are turned upside down, their stuff's been completely destroyed, but they were feeling so happy because they were alive. And it really struck me, and I've never forgotten that. I don't feel like that every day. <laughs> but when I remember that, you, you, yeah, imagine, you've lost everything. Instead of feeling devastated, they're just feeling ex so exhilarated, they're still alive. So imagine if we could tap into that a bit and feel that sense of appreciation for life, for the life that we still have. Imagine how that would shape the way we go about our days. You know, sometimes, quite often, we go on autopilot, just doing what we have to do or doing what we want to do, but how much are we really in it and, and living and breathing it? So just wanted to share that. Probably you will have some stories of things that's hit you like that as well, where you've had this heightened sense of appreciation for, for life. Um, so one of the quotes that stood out for me um, on gratitude was from one of the American presidents, John F. Kennedy. 
He said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Probably naturally most of you appreciate that as well. You know, someone might say something over and over again, but it's when they do act on it, isn't it, that you know they really mean it. So he says, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Um, so the second guideline we can look at is respect. Here it's defined as to honor people with a deeper understanding and experience of life. To honor people with a deeper understanding and experience of life. I think for me, this is becoming a really, you know, different one, different things stand out for us at different times. For me, this is really like a key one that's kind of impacting. When I think about how we relate to each other and ourselves, the more understanding we have about where other people are coming from and where we've come from, you know, we might beat ourselves up for something we did way back or something, or yesterday even. But when we understand the bigger context of it or where we're coming from, we you know, little silly examples like if you're walking, if you're trying to get through this door and then someone elbows you, you know, or kicks you, you probably, the instant response would be, oi. <laughs> but then if you understood that maybe their arm's in a sling or maybe, you know, they had to help someone this way quickly and it made their arm go that way, immediately go, oh, don't worry, you know. <laughs> you know, Or you'd say, oops, I didn't mean to shout at you then. It would soon dissipate that irritation that we had in that moment as soon as we understood why they're coming? Where they're coming from, right? So quite often, in a case where we have a, a deeper understanding of where someone else is coming from, and a deeper understanding of where we ourselves, what we've gone through, and, wh and where we're coming from, it can, it can, we can have acceptance, and it can diffuse any irritation, agitation to ourselves towards, you know, stop us getting angry at ourselves and each other, basically, yeah. And I really like this quote from Albert Einstein from Germany about respect. I mean, he's, he's a genius, isn't he, Albert Einstein? And he seems to have come to a really great conclusions that have impacted the world still today by himself. But he's someone who says, this is something he, Albert Einstein says, a uh, hundred times a day, a uh, hundred times every day, he says, a hundred times every day, I remind myself that my inner and outer life are based on the labors of other men, living and dead. A hundred times every day, I remind myself that my inner and outer life are based on the labors of other men, living and dead. That's pretty profound, isn't it? <laughs> and those of you in the course looking at dependent arising, that doesn't that totally relate to that? <laughs> How everything is interconnected and things depend on causes and conditions and many different factors. Yeah. I didn't know this reflection was going to come up here, but I've been there's one I'd like to share with you, and I just think let's do it now. <laughs> so um for those online, right, for the breakout rooms, so we'll be able to, so 
What I'd like to do is break up into pairs. Um, so those who have joined us online, welcome. I forgot, I didn't have the laptop in front of me, so I didn't say hello, everyone there. Um, we can break out into, yeah, break out rooms in pairs as well. So what we're going to do in a moment, we'll break out into pairs, but first I'll explain what we're going to do when we get there. Um, you're going to think about um, one material object, right? So just call to mind anything, like a cup or any, uh, you know, a wooden spoon, anything you want to think of, a watch. And try and trace back how many people, humans and animals and things, are connected to that one object. So try and find the trail of connection for just one object. How many people are involved in it? Any living beings, people, humans, animals. That's quite straightforward, right? So you're just going to discuss together about one object, choose the object, and then discuss the trail of connection of all the beings involved in it. Yeah. I'll give you a few minutes, but I bet, I bet you won't have enough time, however long I give you, <laughs> to get to the extent of it. Okay, so are we ready online as well to do the breakout? Thank you. So if you'd like to partner up and have a few minutes discussing, yeah. Have a partner? Shall I come?
Does anyone want to share it, what their object was and some of the things that, yeah, roughly, like, just run through a little bit of the trail of connection? Yeah, please. Glasses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you all hear him? Yeah? The the yeah, okay, yeah, can mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So for those online, they, one of the pairs in the group came up with glasses and I won't go over it all again, but basically then the pair of glasses in their hand, well then what about the person who invented, the, what about the glasses, that, the original pair of glasses before this kind of design and then the person who invented them and then all the different people who invented the different types of glasses and magnifying glasses and all the different styles that we have. So, and then the other reflection on the side of that trail of connection was also um, we look at gratitude and reflect on you know, having gratitude for the food and the things involved in the food and stuff. But actually, when you do this kind of reflection, then it gets really interesting, like trying to, yeah, you get... And do, do, do you saying that a sense of appreciation kind of arises for all the people in beings involved in that one product? Did some of the others, did you kind of feel that sense? Yeah, would you like to share? Uh, we discussed on Jupiter's camera. Camera, mm -hmm. Camera is an illusion, Yeah. So that way, and then actually, it's being actually manufactured and then being wrapped up, wrapped up again in a box, maybe. <laughs> That's the thing. Every we, one thing has a tangent of other things, isn't it? So again, for online, this one pair came up with the camera, and then the camera, you know, someone, in, it's an innovation, so someone designed and created that, you know, the idea of the camera. So then they had the design, they wrote down the design, so then they probably used a pencil or something, and then the pencil came, you know, from the trees, that, or the, the farmer must have farmed the trees or something like that, so all the, and then so on and so on, and like from each, from one thing, then these other things are involved, and then they came from somewhere, and someone else's work are basically like that, isn't it? So thank you, so... We can't ask those online um, about there, but I'm sure you had similar reflections. So we'll just take a couple more in the in the, from in the group. Yeah, please. What is that? Oh, a mala? Yeah, a rosary, a bead, <laughs> a string of beads, <laughs> a yak bone. You traced everything back. <laughs> I'm teasing. Yeah, yeah, I'm teasing, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
So starting off with this little string of beads made from yak bone, then contemplating the farmer, the yak farmer, and then all the ancestors. If there wasn't the ancestors of that yak farmer, then there wouldn't be that yak farmer. Yeah, and so, and um, money. Yeah, so for buying the, so this is, was a little bit different reflection from the other reflections. So if I went down a different avenue, this new one is about the ancestors. Similarly, that they would have bought the, the rosary or the mala or the string of beads made from yak bone with money. And, that, that, and then thinking about the first person who invented money and that they had parents and their ancestors and then all the ancestors. So the final conclusion was that probably 99.9% .9 of all the people on the planet were involved in that one thing. <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's a quote by Rumi, the um, Sufi uh, mystic. And I've seen different versions of it online. Um, so, but the basic gist of it is like, so sometimes it says, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. That's the main one that you see. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. But then there's a nuance on that, and another way I've seen it, and I actually really like this one best. You're both a drop in the ocean and an ocean in the drop. <laughs> you, are an, uh, you are a drop in the ocean and an ocean in the drop. That kind of shows the two-way dependency. That's why I love it. <laughs> The being the drop in the ocean makes me think of a quote that from His Holiness the Dalai Lama where sometimes we feel we don't have much self-confidence and we don't feel that we feel that we make an impact. We feel quite tiny and insignificant in this world. And His Holiness said, if you think you're too small to make a difference, think about trying to get to sleep with a mosquito in your room. <laughs> <laughs> But then this being the ocean in a drop, uh, this is very much relating to our reflections now. You know, you have one little thing, the drop, the glasses, the, you know, whatever they are, and then everything and everyone ends up being a, a condition for that thing or related to that one thing, right? When I did a very brief weekend course, I've done a couple with this teacher. He's a, the ancient Buddhist um, paintings, the Tanka paintings. So there's a German um, master of the art, shall I call him? So Andrew Weber, he goes around and um, teaches in different centers in the West. And when he came to where I was living in Australia, he, before we do the the drawing and then the painting, so he always gets us to do a meditation, a mindfulness meditation at the start, and you start with the breathing, and then and then you go out and basically when you trace the level of dependency and connection of everything, he said everything can be traced back to the clouds, not to the eye cloud, to a cloud, a cloud, <laughs> to a cloud, like from you know, because everything depends on like the drops of rain. You know, if it's a cup of tea or something, it's come from, not necessarily directly. <laughs> you know, we all exist because it rains, doesn't it? Because <laughs> there's sun and stuff. So, and any reflection you're trying to do, basically we're looking at the materials that we have to draw with for the course, you know. But you try and find anything else, maybe, that doesn't depend on the cloud. So it's nice, this is this, yeah, the ocean in a drop and the drop in the ocean kind of connection with things. So thank you, Gage, engaging so <laughs> yeah, happily in that discussion. We'll, we'll do another 
pair activity in a little while to show another tool that we can use to to draw on to you know look at and work with and nurture our good qualities our human values so we've looked at briefly just touched on gratitude and respect but if we also I definitely want to talk about respect a little bit more so please remind me to come back to that but we'll look, we'll just introduce the next two so we'll start with forgiveness So looking at how we relate to each other, so relating with forgiveness. Forgiveness is defined as to let go of resentment and anger towards ourselves and others. To let go of resentment and anger towards ourselves and others. Excuse me. And we have a lovely quote from Desmond Tutu from South Africa. So Desmond Tutu says, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu, right? He says, to forgive is not just to be altruistic. It is the best form of self-interest. To forgive is not just to be altruistic. It is the best form of self-interest. It's a very beautiful quote, because often when we think about forgiveness, we usually think in, you do it for the other person, let them off the hook kind of thing, isn't it? That's a normal kind of sense of forgiveness. Why do we forgive? So the other person feels better, right? But like what Archbishop Desmond Tutu is saying here, that forgiveness is actually the best form of self-interest. Have any of you, you don't have to share the experience now with the whole group, but have any of you had experiences where you, maybe you were holding on to something, but then you were able to forgive, and you remember how that felt? Did it feel better, or did it feel... <laughs> so much better. Mm. Did you want to share? Okay. Yeah, so from the group we had... This, when he was able to forgive, he felt so much better. I mean, enough said, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's true, right? Yeah, my father, he had a grudge against someone he really held in high esteem for about 15 years. Then that person became very seriously ill, and, and just my dad just accidentally bumped into him, and he knew that he was really ill, and, and he sincerely just wanted that other person to be all right in that moment. And um, he just said in that moment, he just forgave him all the stuff in the past. It just didn't matter anymore. So they didn't even have to work anything out. Sometimes you have to work stuff out, but in this case, they didn't have to. But what I'm getting at is afterwards, when my dad told me this, because he was really happy that he'd reunited with this person again and was able to sort of extend his hand to that person when they, you know, before they passed, basically. And um, I said to dad, how did you feel once you're able to forgive him. And he said, like a knife had been pulled out of my heart. That was huge, <laughs> yeah. So, does anyone have any doubt that forgiveness is the best form of, or a form of self-interest? Mm. What? Well, how to have forgiveness for? So, what about forgiveness for yourself? You mean how to have it, or why to have it, or is it useful? I think it was genuine forgiveness. Where this is what I was getting at at the start of the session as well about how we relate. When we think about how we relate to ourselves, if we can have under good understanding for where we're coming from, quite often, you know, we can, there's, there's more room to forgive things we've done before. Doesn't necessarily mean you go, it's okay what we did before, you know, it doesn't con condone it. And like His Holiness said, when you forgive, you don't have to forget. It doesn't mean forgetting what happened.
can every action and things be forgiven? Well, it's an individual thing, I think, within our limitations, as much as we're able to open up to understanding. Because, again, forgiving doesn't mean condoning and saying it's all right and please do it again, you know. But, and, but, mm, and each of us are coming, and, and we sh should also not beat ourselves up for not being able to forgive, because we we're at we're where we're at in our journey, right? So we have to have, this is a, we also have to have understanding about where we're at now, if we're not able to take that step to forgive. We know it's in our interest, or we can trust that it's in our interest to do it, but we can't bring ourselves to do it yet. We also need to have kindness and understanding to ourselves for not and others if we don't force someone else to forgive the other person, because we'd feel better if they're talking. You know, we have to understand where we're coming from. So. I think it's reasonable to open our hearts to forgive almost anything, really. But it's within our, in our own limitations where we're at at that time. You know, some behaviours seem so atrocious and um, seem unforgivable, right? But this is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, def defenseless, helpless beings who, yeah, who have been harmed. Uh, um, yeah, it's hard to get our head around those things. I mean, if I was face to face with someone who'd done something really awful to some, someone in a desperate state, I'm not saying that my instant reaction is going to be <laughs> forgiving to them. But there's room to have forgiveness for them. And there's many stories, you know. His, the Dalai Lama really admires and has cultivated a deep friendship with a, a man in Ireland. Um, you know, the troubles in Ireland, that they, they have the same faith, but they have different ways of practicing that faith, that it caused massive friction in the country. And um, one, one shot another, and they were blind for the rest of their life. So the one who was blinded has become a great friend of the Dalai Lama's because the Dalai Lama reached out to him, amazed by his almost immediate forgiveness for, for I don't know how quick it was, but his forgiveness for the person who blinded him for the rest of his life. And, the, and not only that, but the person who shot the one who's blind and the one who's blind have become very good friends. You know, it's one story. And also, we mentioned Desmond Tutu. So Desmond Tutu came here to India for His Holiness's 80th birthday a few years back. And the two, they made a book called um, The Book of Joy. Yeah. It's an amazing book. And there's also, because um, I was starting to think of it with the name, of, they've made a film of it as well, a documentary about it called Mission Joy. And in there, there's a really like exp a deep exploration of forgiveness. And when you think of Archbishop Tutu and what he was standing up for, for the apartheid in Africa, he saw all these atrocities that would seemingly be unforgivable. And he's the one who was fighting for, you know, against that. And he's the one saying it's in, you know, for the, not only it's altruistic, but it's also in the best interest. So no matter how awful something someone's been and how awful the behavior is it seems there is room for forgiveness for forgiveness but it depends on where we're at and what we're able to draw on to to get there yeah so it can't be forced so thanks for bringing that up and you know maybe we have different perspectives on that i'm not given the absolute answer this is how it should be my feeling is that it's like that yeah because when you know when you come back to respect and thinking about we we so easily can judge others. It's a natural kind of in, not. It's not who we are, but it's such a strong habit that we have of judging circumstances and judging other people. But we have no idea how we'd behave in the same circumstances, do we? Like if we were, like I watched the documentary on um, Syria quite a few years ago, and they showed these like little children at primary school and. They were having a class, and then suddenly it gets bombed, you know, not in their classroom, but around the area, and then they all have to run for cover. So they're all living in this state of trauma day to day. Not only that, the little five-year-old children are all being drummed in by their uncles and relatives to hate 
the other side and likewise vice versa. So that's what they're being brought up in that atmosphere. It's hard to think that you'd have any other way of thinking about things than, than that if we were brought up in that same situation, right? So when we think about it like that, it's, yeah, just this respect. So a friend of mine quite a few years ago said to me, nobody's perfect, but understanding is most important. And that's become as well something I've really held <laughs> close to my heart because it just seemed like if we're able to understand where others are coming from, it help us with acceptance and, and forgiveness. And likewise with ourselves, like you were asking about. Like if I think about the circumstances I grew up in, then I can see why I ended up being a bit like this in a certain way and why I did that in another way. And, and then I can sort of accept it and then forgive it and move on from it, kind of. So... Definitely, the more we look deeper, deeper and understand where we're coming from, we can understand ourselves better, and likewise with others. And so, Lama Yeshi, one of the founders of our organisation, so he, he, there's this little quote from him that was in one of the senior nuns' rooms when I was staying in her room in the nunnery in Australia. So she had moved somewhere else, and I was staying in a room. This little quote was on the wall, and um, that had a big impact on me as well. It said. Be gentle with yourself. When you're gentle with yourself, you'll be more gentle with others. And it's really related with this. So be gentle with yourself. When you're gentle with yourself, you'll be more gentle with others. I, personally, I found that's something I'm really trying to live by because I find it really helping me to not judge myself so harshly and not judge other people so harshly. And when we look at this wisdom theme about how we relate to others, it really is spot on with that, isn't it? If we're really harsh on ourselves, then we'd be more harsher on others, right? If we're more gentle on ourselves, it'll ripple out to be more gentle with others. So really how we relate to others, first we need to take care of how we relate to ourselves, have a healthier relationship with, yeah, be kinder to ourselves, really. That makes sense. And, um, oh, Right, last of this of the last wisdom, um, the last guideline of this wisdom theme is loyalty, and then we'll get on with the next exercise. Um, so loyalty is defined as to be good-hearted and dependable in all our relationships. To be good-hearted and dependable in all our re relationships. To be good-hearted and dependable in all our relationships. And then we have a, a sweet little quote from a British author called Charlotte Bronte. She says, we must love friends for their sake rather than for our own. <laughs> we must love friends for their sake rather, for the, the, rather than for our own. So out of being good-hearted and dependable, dependable is more the long-term thing, isn't it? Standing by through, yeah, thick and thin ups and downs and time and distance. So, yeah, time's going to go really quickly. I'd like to share with you this tool or exercise called, it comes in psychology, called reframing. There's these tools called pre-framing and reframing. So reframing, what we're going to do is we're going to pair up again. And when we look at something, we're going to look at something that's happened in, to us or has happened to us or is happening to us that is, you know, that is a bit of a problem for us or is, you know, that, that we don't like, it's not gone so well. And then um, we don't want to look at the, the worst one, the most difficult situation we're going through, just like a, a lighter one, but something that's been pushing our buttons or not quite comfortable with this that we've had a bit of problems with. And then we, what we want to do, so you'll call that thing to mind, that situation, try and think of it clearly and like concisely. 
and then you'll express that, you'll tell that to your partner. So we'll, we'll partner up and call ourselves A and B. <laughs> so A will tell B the situation briefly and then just for two minutes, then what we'll do is we'll stop and then B will choose one of these four guidelines and say, and to reframe, like how would that situation be if you could apply, for example, forgiveness or respect? How would that situation, how could that situation be different? How could it be if it, you know, if you could bring gratitude into that or respect, loyalty or forgiveness into that? So you can choose one of the four, right? Does that make sense? And then and we'll reverse it. So, so then that person, so you'll suggest what, how would it be if you reframed it with this guideline? And then there'll be a couple of minutes to reframe it. The other p person A will then try and reframe that situation with that guideline. And then we'll reverse the process. Then B has a turn to share their s situation. And after a couple of minutes, then A will suggest, how would that be if you could reframe it with this guideline? And then they'll have a couple of minutes to reframe it. Does that make sense? Is that clear, the exercise? So if you'd all like to, oh, sorry, you have a question? Okay, so if you'd like to pa partner up again and choose one who's gonna be A, or do, do you wanna just spend a couple of minutes now all, to, all together, quietly, just thinking of your situation that you're gonna, sh then we don't have to spend time when we partner up. So just each of you call to mind a situation that you're, you're going through or have gone through that's not the most painful one, the, not the most difficult, that has been a bit difficult for you, a bit of a problem. Just think about what that is and try and make it concise so that you can share it with your partner in a few moments. Of course, if you prefer not to do this exercise, you're welcome to sit it out as well. Okay, so those of you who'd like to engage in it, would you like to partner up? And the same to invite those online to break out in rooms if you'd like to. If, you'd, if, you'd, if you're online and you'd like to do it, but you don't want to break out in the rooms, you can just do it quietly to yourself, the same exercise too. Oh, similarly in the room, if you'd prefer to keep it to yourself and not share it with another, you can just reflect on it, and then after a couple of minutes, reflect on which of these guidelines you could draw on to reframe it. Okay, so I'll give you a minute to pair up, and then we'll start the exercise.
Uh, no, it's time to reframe the moment now. So, yeah, so now for you to choose which of the, for your partner to choose which of these four guidelines, gratitude, respect, loyalty, or forgiveness, the, and suggest one of those to your partner and say, how could you reframe that situation? Then give them a couple of minutes to reframe it and share. Okay, so thank you. Now if you'd like to swap, swap um, roles, so now B can share their experience for a couple of minutes. So now your part, the other partner share their story, that they'd, yeah, the difficult situation that they'd like to reframe. So they share the situation and then after a couple of minutes I'll ring again for us to choose a guideline to reframe it. Off you go. <laughs> Okay, so now for the other partner to suggest one of the four guidelines to reframe that situation.
Okay, everyone, I'd like to invite you back to the group. Okay. So we don't have time to reflect back to the group, to share back with the group, but just spend a moment quietly to yourselves and see if you found any value or benefit. Was it helpful to apply one of these guidelines to reframe a difficult situation? Just from your own experience just there, can you see any benefit in that? If so, what? Okay, so this is an exercise that if you did find it helpful, you can do with your friend or by yourself at any time. It doesn't necessarily have to be with these four guidelines, but if you're from whatever field of knowledge you have, whatever experience you have, you know, the basic human values of kindness and understanding, love and compassion, forgiveness, these kind of things, if you can draw from any of them, or just, you know, being more respectful, being more humble in this situation, could that help me? If you're able to draw on any of those things, then you can spend a little time reflecting, and you can do it for reframing previous gone difficult situations. You can also do it for up and coming things that are giving you a bit of anxiety that you're not looking forward to, that you're dreading, thinking that you're already imagining it's not going to turn out so well. But how could, how could it? How could it be different if I could apply, if I could come from it from this way? You know, if you can think like that, that can also, that's called pre-framing, and that's looking at a situation up, up and coming, and you know, that can maybe help you deal with that in a more, yeah, positive way. So we're really almost out of time. I just wanted to come back to when we were talking about forgiveness, and about if anything is, for, you know, if everything is forgivable. So, so far we've been looking from a, a universal kind of framework, a secular, non-Buddhist in particular kind of way. But if we were to draw from the ancient wisdom of the Buddha, so, excuse me, in the presentation of ourselves, that a person, we're made up of our body and our mind, and that our minds in the presentation from the Buddhist perspective of mind, our, na our minds by nature are clear. And it says that there's this beautiful quote by Maitreya that says, the nature of mind is clear light and the stains are adventitious. This has been something that has inspired me for years, ever since I heard it. So the nature of mind is clear light and the stains are adventitious. And what it means is that by nature our minds are pure, like water, if you take the analogy, I know I'm going to spend, there's so much to say about it. So if you have an analogy of water and you can mix, water can be polluted, right? But the, if, the pollute, if the pollution was one with the nature of water, you could not purify that water. It would be impossible to remove the pollutants from the water if the water was by its nature polluted. Sometimes water is together with the pollution, but because pollution never enters into the nature of water, it can be removed from the water. We all know that. It's the same with our minds. So I'm just going to express it now. If it sparks some interest in you, you can follow it through and learn more about it in the future. From the Buddhist perspective, the presentation of the mind, is that mind is by nature pure, and when we look at water with the pollutants, what are we talking about with pollutants of the mind? All our afflictions, all our destructive emotions, all the agitations of our mind, all the mental afflictions, like our anger and our, our pride, our ego, our jealousy, you know, our lack of self-confidence, all these things and many more. They're, they're, they're just together with our mind because of habituation, but they're not 
who we really are. They haven't entered into the nature of the mind, so they can be removed from the mind. How? Through cultivating their, what we would call antidotes, their opposite, more holistic, positive, wholesome states of mind. You know, like the antidote to jealousy is like delighting in other people's good fortune and good situations like that. The antidote to anger, love and patience. Anyway, so what that comes to is there's a quote from one of their ancient Indian Buddhist masters called Shantideva in his Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And he gives an analogy of, he's saying that, so if someone hits you with a stick, I can't quote the verse word for word, but he basically says, if someone hits you with a stick, you don't get angry with the stick. You get angry with the person who's wielding the stick, who's the person who's holding the stick and hits you. That's what we get angry at, right? Because the stick has no control, right? And when you apply that analogy, then we, what we want to do is we want to separate the action from the agent. Like basically, we don't get person, we don't get angry at the person. So here, the person is like the stick. We get angry at the afflictions that motivated the person, because the person is under the control of those afflictions or disturbing emotions. That makes sense. So just like the stick doesn't have any control, it's the one wheeled in it. Sometimes we are overpowered or overwhelmed by our afflictions, our disturbing emotions. And so we don't have, in that moment, we don't have control. So what we want to get angry at is the afflictions, not the person. Well, it doesn't mean you let anyone off the hook. You think, you, you take action, say, oi, that's not all right, but without getting angry at the person. You can do it from another motivation. Actually, the motivation of compassion is more powerful, more clear mind. Remember with the benefits of contemplative practice and thing, if we're able to be more compassionate, you know, our, we won't, our blood won't boil in the instant. We'll be able to, and it says you have more enhanced clarity. We'll be able to think more clearly what's a more reasonable plan of action to stop them doing what they're doing. Maybe you have to stick them in jail for what they've done, but without anger. It just frees us from getting all worked up about it. It doesn't, it doesn't say, it doesn't make them not accountable. And it doesn't make us, oh, oh it doesn't matter. I, was, I, didn't, you know, I didn't have any control. It was my anger. You, you're the one who let anger be the driver of your, you know, in the driving seat. We have to can take control of it. But when you're able to create that bit of distance between, yeah, then it stops us getting more angry and it helps us to keep our cool, think more clearly and be, relate with more understanding and more kindness to ourselves and others. Does that make sense? So you've got, we have to find that balance. So thank you for bringing it up. It doesn't mean we, we don't have responsibility, but it just means we can do something about it. We're not stuck <laughs> with our anger and neither are other people. So we help each other along to become more open-hearted and good-hearted and help others along to do the same, like see the best in them, see their pure potential, like that. So we're already over. I'd love to have more discussion with you and I really appreciate it, all your, your interaction, engaging in the, in the um, discussion that we've shared. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate our time together. And I'd also just like for, to think, yeah, these days of miracles, these 15 days, we're doing them here at Tushita with the motivation to dedicate for the swift return of Lama Zopa Rinpoche. Um, why? I mean, we're all... We're here directly and indirectly because of his, his and Lama Yeshu's kindness. This place exists because of him, and we have this opportunity to come and learn together in this place. So my real strong wish and prayer is that his reincarnation swiftly comes back because when I think about how many people have benefited from his you know, presence in the world, you know, the hundreds and hundreds upon thousands of thousands in Tushita and other places, other Lama Zobas, other senders around the world, it's immeasurable. We all benefit even a small amount from it, but most of us quite a lot from it. So it's definitely contributing to world peace. It's definitely contributing to our well-being. So my wish is for many, many more people to have such a great opportunity you know, to meet with such a, some, a living example who embodies all of these really good qualities to the, who's developed them so much that you can't help but be, have it rubbed off on you when you meet him too. So I def yeah, sincerely pray that for Lama's over the swift return so that many more people like us can be benefited from him.
Yeah, and also I deeply wish for all of you to have, you know, for the rest of your lives to have happy, meaningful and good lives. So yeah, thank you very much and hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at Tushita and thank you online for those of you who joined us too. Okay, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.